One of the most recognized tales in American folklore has Mississippi roots. The story has many names, including the Delta Legend, the Deal with the Devil, and the Deal at the Crossroads, among others. Yet each tells a similar story that centers on a midnight meeting between a frustrated guitarist and Satan himself. Scholars disagree over the origins of the Crossroad myth. Some maintain that the story originated in Africa, with Satan representing an African trickster deity. This interpretation places the tale in a broader cultural context and elevates the musician to spiritual status. Other folklorists argue that the tale possesses many Western elements and reflects slavery's impact on African American life. Regardless of its precise origins, the myth has become most associated with the early 20th century blues man, Robert Johnson. But take the blues man and the Mississippi Delta out of the story and you're left with a familiar and repeating myth that has echoed through modern history drawing its closest Western parallel to the German myth about Faust, who is a highly successful man, yet is dissatisfied with his life, which leads him to make a pact with the devil at a crossroads, exchanging his soul for unlimited knowledge and worldly pleasures. The Faust legend has been the basis for many literary, artistic, cinematic, and musical works that have recycled and reinterpreted the basic story through the ages. Faust and the adjective Faustian imply sacrificing spiritual values for power, knowledge, or material gain. But if you take another step back, you can see that all these Faustian myths share similar structures with the Theophilius legend, recorded in the 13th century, in which a saintly figure makes a bargain with the keeper of the infernal world, but is rescued from paying his debt to society through the mercy of the Blessed Virgin, which itself can be traced back to Saint Theophilius, the Pentinent, or Theophilius of Adana who was a cleric in the 6th century church and said to have made a deal with the devil to gain an ecclesiastical position. His story is significant as it is one of the oldest popular stories of a pact with the devil and was an inspiration for the Theophilius legend, which inspired the Faust legend, which in turn may have inspired the crossroads myth of the Mississippi Delta and cemented the legacy of one, Robert Johnson. Except. This explanation of Western religion says nothing about the similarities existing for centuries within the previously mentioned myths stemming from African folklore. Could it be that 6th century historians simply appropriated this piece of African cultural heritage? It wouldn't be the first time. Or perhaps we're digging too deep and the answer is something simpler, something more sinister. The devil is in the details, and perhaps we've been witness to the same story, the same Satan, playing the same con on unwitting men throughout all of recorded history. This is The Man in the Black Suit by Stephen King, in memory of my father, Randall Hill. Rest in peace, Dad. I'm now a very old man, and this is something which happened to me when I was very young, only nine years old. It was 1914, the summer after my brother Dan died in the West Field and three years before America got into World War I. I've never told anybody about what happened at the fork in the stream that day, and I never will, at least not with my mouth. I've decided to write it down, though, in this book which I will leave on the table beside my bed. I can't write long, because my hands shake so these days I have next to no strength, but I don't think it will take long. Later someone may find what I have written, that seems likely to me, as it is pretty much human nature to look in a bookmarked diary after its owner has passed along. 
So yes, my words will probably be read. The better question is whether or not anyone will believe them. Almost certainly not. But that doesn't matter. It's not belief I'm interested in, but freedom. Writing can give that, I found. For 20 years I wrote a column called Long Ago and Far Away for the Castle Rock Call, and I know that sometimes it works that way. What you write down sometimes leaves you forever, like old photographs left in the bright sun, fading to nothing but white. I pray for that sort of release. A man in his 90s should be well past the terrors of childhood, but as my infirmity slowly crept up on me, like waves licking closer and closer to some indifferently built castle of sand, that terrible face grows clearer and clearer in my mind's eye. It glows like a dark star in the constellations of my childhood. What I might have done yesterday, what I might have seen here in my room at the nursing home, what I might have said to them or they to me, those things are gone. But the face of the man in the black suit grows ever clearer, ever closer. And I remember every word he said. I don't want to think of him, but I can't help it. And sometimes at night my old heart beats so fast and so hard, I think it will tear itself right clear of my chest. So I uncap my fountain pen and force my trembling old hand to write this pointless anecdote in the diary of of my great-grandchildren. I can't remember her name for sure. At least not right now. But I know it starts with an S. Uh, it gave to me last Christmas. And which I have never written in until now. Now, I will write in it. I will write the story of how I met the man in the black suit on the bank of the castle stream one afternoon in the summer of 1914. The town of Martin it was a different world in those days, more different than I could ever tell you. It was a world without airplanes droning overhead, a world almost without cars and trucks, a world where the skies were not cut into lanes and sliced by overhead power lines. There was not a single paved road in the whole town, and the business district consisted of nothing but Corson's general store, Thut's livery and hardware, the Methodist church at Christ Corner, the school, the town hall, and Harry's restaurant half a mile down from there, which my mother called, with unfailing disdain, the liquor house. Mostly, though, the difference was in how people lived, how apart they were. I'm not quite sure people born after the middle of the 20th century could quite credit that, although they might say that they could, to be polite to old folks like me. There were no phones in Western Maine back then, for one thing. The first one wouldn't be installed for another five years, and by the time there was one in our house, I was 19 going to college at the University of Maine in Orono. That is only the roof of the thing. There was no doctor closer than Casco, and no more than a dozen houses in which you would call town. There was no neighborhoods. I'm not even sure we knew the word, although we had a verb, neighboring that described church functions and barn dances, and open fields were the exception rather than the rule. Out of town, the houses were farms that stood far apart from each other, and from December until middle March, we mostly hunkered down in the little pockets of stone warmth we called families. We hunkered and listened to the wind in the chimney and hoped no one would get sick or break a leg or get a head full of bad ideas, like the farmer over in Castle Rock who had chopped up his wife and three kids winters before and said in court that the ghosts made him do it. In those days before the Great War, most of Martin was woods and bog, dark, long places full of moose and mosquitoes, snakes and secrets. In those days, there were ghosts everywhere. This thing I'm telling about happened on a Saturday. My father gave me a whole list of chores to do, including some that would have been Dan's, if he'd still been alive. He was my only brother, and he died of being stung by a bee. A year had gone by, and still my mother wouldn't hear that. She said it was something else, had to have been, that no one ever died of being stung by a bee. When Mama Sweet, the oldest lady in the Methodist ladies' aid, tried to tell her at the church supper the previous winter this was 
that the same had happened to her favorite uncle back in 73. My mother clapped her hands over her ears, got up, walked out of the church basement. She's never been back since, and nothing my father could say to her would change her mind. She claimed she was done with church, and that if she ever had to see Helen Roshbow again, that was Mama Sweet's real name, that she would slap her eyes out. She wouldn't be able to help herself, she said. That day, Dad wanted me to lug wood for the wood stove, weed the beans and the cukes, pitch hay out the loft, get two jugs of water and put in the cold pantry, scrape as much old paint off the cellar bulkhead as I could. Then, he said, I could go fishing, if I didn't mind going by myself. He had to go and see Bill Eversham about some cows. I said I sure didn't mind going by myself, and Dad smiled, and that didn't surprise him very much. He'd given me a bamboo pole the week before. Not because it was my birthday or anything, but just because he liked to give me things, sometimes. And I was wild to try it in Castle Stream, which was by far the troutiest brook I ever fished. But don't you go too far in the woods, he told me. Not beyond where it splits. No, sir. Promise me. Yes, I, yes sir, I promise. Now promise your mother. We were standing on the back stoop. I had been bound for the spring house with the water jugs when my dad stopped me. Now he turned me around to face my mother who was standing at the marble counter with a flood of strong morning sunshine falling through the double windows over the sink. There was a curl of hair lying across the side of her forehead that touched her eyebrow. You see how well I remember it all. The light, the bright light turned that little curl to filaments of gold and made me want to run to her and put my arms around her. In that instant, I saw her as a woman, saw her as my father must have seen her. She was wearing a house dress with little red roses all over it. I remember she was kneading bread. Candy Bill, our little black Scotty dog, was standing alertly beside her feet, looking up, waiting for anything that might drop. My mother was looking at me. I promise, I said. She smiled, but it was the worried kind of smile she always seemed to make, since my father brought Dan back from the west field in his arms. My father had come sobbing and bare-chested. He had taken off his shirt and draped it over Dan's face, which had swelled and turned color. My boy, he'd been crying. Oh, look at my boy. Jesus, look at my boy. I remember as if that had been yesterday. It was the only time I ever heard my dad take the Savior's name in vain. What do you promise, Gary? She asked. Promise not to go no further than where it forks, ma'am. Any further? Any. She gave me a patient look, saying nothing as her hands went on working in the dough, which now had a smooth, silky look. I promise not to go any further than where it forks, ma'am. Thank you, Gary, she said, and try to remember the grammar is for the world as well as for the school. Yes, ma'am. Candy Bill followed me as I did my chores and sat between my feet as I bolted my lunch, looking up at me with the same attentiveness he had shown my mother while she was kneading her bread. But when I got my new bamboo pole and my old splintery creel and started out of the dooryard, he stopped and only looked in the dust by an old roll of snow fence, watching. I called him, but he wouldn't come. He yapped a time or two as if telling me to come back, but that's all it was. Stay then, I said, trying to sound as though I didn't care. I did, though, at least a little. Candy Bill always went fishing with me. My mother came to the door and looked out at me with her left hand held up to shade her eyes. I can see her that way still. And it's like looking at a photograph of someone who would later become unhappy or died suddenly. You mind your dad now, Gary? Yes, ma'am, I will. She waved, and I waved too. Then I turned my back on her and walked away. The sun beat down on my neck, hard and hot, for the first quarter mile or so, but then I entered the woods, where double shadow fell over the road, and it was cool and fur smelled, and you could hear the wind hissing through the deep needled groves. I walked with my pole on my shoulder like boys did back then, holding my creel in my other hand like a valise or a salesman's sample case. About two miles into the woods along a road which was really nothing but a double rut with a grassy strip growing up on the center hump, I began to hear the hurried, eager gossip of Castle Stream. 
I thought of trout with bright speckled backs and pure white bellies, and my heart went up in my chest. The stream flowed under a little wooden bridge, and the banks leading down to the water were steep and brushy. I worked my way down, carefully, holding on where I could and digging my heels in. I went down to the summer and back in mid-spring or so it felt. The cool rose gentle off the water, like a green smell, like moss. And when I got to the edge of the water, I only stood there for a little while, breathing the deep of that mossy smell, and watched the dragonflies circle and the skitterbugs skate. Then farther down, I saw a trout leap at a butterfly, a good big brookie, maybe 14 inches long. I remembered I hadn't come here just to sightsee. I walked along the bank, followed the current, and wet my line for the first time with the bridge still in sight upstream. Something jerked the tip of my pole down a time or two and ate half my worm, but he was too sly for my nine-year-old hands, or maybe just not hungry enough to be careless, so I went on. I stopped at two or three other places before I got to the place where Castle Stream forks, going southwest into Castle Rock, and at one of them I caught the biggest trout I had ever caught in my life, a beauty that measured 19 inches from tip to tail on the ruler I kept in my creel. That was a monster of a brook trout, even for those days. If I had accepted this as gift enough for one day and gone back, I would not be writing now. And this is going to turn out longer than I thought it would, I see that already. But I didn't. Instead, I saw to my catch right then and there, as my father had shown me, cleaning it, placing it on dry grass at the bottom of the creel, and laying damp grass on top of it, and went on. I did not, at age nine, think that catching a 19-inch brook trout was particularly remarkable, although I do remember being amazed that my line had not broken when I, netless as was artless, had hauled him out and swung him towards me as a clumsy tail-flapping arc. Ten minutes later, I came to the place where the stream splits in those days. It's now long gone. There's a settlement of duplex homes where Castle Stream once went its course, and a district grammar school as well. And if there's a stream, it goes in darkness, dividing around a huge gray rock nearly the size of our outhouse. There was a pleasant flat space here, grassy and soft, overlooking what my dad and I called South Branch. I squatted on my heels, dropped my line into the water, and almost immediately snagged a fine rainbow trout. He wasn't the size of my brookie, only a foot or so, but a good fish just the same. I had it cleaned out before the gills had stopped flexing, stored it in my creel, and dropped my line back into the water. This time, there was no immediate bite, so I leaned back. Looking up at the blue stripe of sky, I could see along the stream's course. Clouds floated by, west to east, and I tried to think what they looked like. I saw a unicorn, then a rooster, then a dog that looked a little like Candy Bill. I was looking for the next one when I drowsed off. Or well, maybe slept, I don't know for sure. All I know is that tug on my line was so strong it almost pulled the bamboo right out of my hands, what was brought back in the afternoon. I sat up, clutched the pole, and suddenly became aware that something was sitting on the tip of my nose. I crossed my eye and saw a bee. My heart seemed to fall dead in my chest, and for a horrible second I was sure I was going to wet my pants. The tug of my line again came stronger this time, but although I maintained my grip on the end of the pole so it wouldn't be pulled into the stream, perhaps carried away, I think I even had the presence of mind to snub the line with my forefinger, I made no effort to pull in my catch. All my horrified attention was fixated on the fat black and yellow thing that was using my nose as a rest stop. I slowly poked out my lower lip and blew upward. The bee ruffled a little but kept its pace. I blew again and it ruffled again, but this time it also seemed to shift impatiently. I didn't dare blow any more for fear it would lose its temper completely and give me a shot. It was too close for me to focus on what it was doing, but it was easy for me to imagine it ramming its stinger into one of my nostrils and shooting its poison up towards my eyes and my brain. A terrible idea came to me. This was the very bee which had killed my brother. I knew it wasn't true that and not only because honeybeads probably don't live longer than a single year, except for the queens, when, again, I'm not so sure. It couldn't be true, because bees died when they stung, and even at nine, I knew it. Their stingers were barbed, and when they f tried to fly away, after doing their deed, they tore themselves apart. 
Still, the idea stayed. This was a special bee, a devil bee, and it had come back to finish the other of Albion and Loretta's two boys. And here's something else. I've been stung by bees before, and although the stings had swelled more than is perhaps usual, I, I can't really say for sure, I had never died from them. That was only for my brother, a terrible trap which had been laid for him in his very making, a trap which I had somehow escaped. But as I crossed my eyes until they hurt in an effort to focus on the bee, logic did not exist. It was the bee that existed. Only that, the bee had killed my brother, killed him so bad that my father had slipped down the strap on his overalls so he could take off his shirt and cover Dan's swelled, engorged face. Even in the depths of his grief, he had done that, because he didn't want his wife to see what had become of her firstborn. Now, the bee had returned, and it would now kill me. It would kill me, and I would die in convulsions on the bank, flopping just as a brooksy flops after you take the hook out of his mouth. I sat there, trembling on the edge of panic, of simply bolting to my feet, and then bolting anywhere. There came a report from behind me. It was a shot, preemptory as a pistol shot. But I knew it wasn't a pistol shot. It was someone clapping his hands. One single clap. At the moment it came, the bee tumbled off my nose and fell into my lap. It lay there on my pants with its legs sticking up in its stinger, a threatless black thread against the old scuffed brown of the corduroy. It was dead as a doornail. I saw that at once. At the same moment, the pole gave another tug, the hardest yet, and I almost lost it again. I grabbed it with both hands and gave it a big stupid yank that would have made my father clutch his head with both hands if he had been there to see it. A rainbow trout, a good bit larger than the one I'd already caught, rose out of the water in a wet, writhing flash spraying fine drops of water from its filament of tail. It looked like one of those romanticized fish pictures they used to put on the cover of men's magazines like True and Man's Adventure back in the 40s and 50s. At that moment, hauling in that big one was the last thing on my mind, however, when the line snapped and the fish fell back into the stream. I barely noticed. I looked over my shoulder to see who had clapped. A man was standing above me at the edge of the trees. His face was very long and pale. His black hair was combed tight against his skull and parted with rigorous care on the side of his narrow head. He was very tall. He was wearing a black three-piece suit, and I knew right away this was not a human being, because his eyes were the orangey red of flames in a wood stove. I don't just mean the irises, because he had no irises and no pupils and certainly no whites. His eyes were completely orange, an orange that shifted and flickered. And it's really too late not to say exactly what I mean, isn't it? He was on fire inside, and his eyes were like the little portholes you sometimes see in stove doors. My bladder let go, and the scuffle brown the dead bee was laying on went a little darker. I was hardly aware of what had happened, and I couldn't take my eyes off the man standing on the top of the bank and looking down at me. The man who had walked out thirty miles of trackless western Maine woods in a fine black suit and narrow shoes of gleam and leather. I could see the watch chain looped across his vest, glittering in the summer sunshine. There was not so much as a single pine needle on him, and he was smiling at me. Why, it's a fisher boy, he cried in a mellow, pleasing voice. Imagine that. Are we well met, fisher boy? Hello, sir. I said. The voice that came out of me did not tremble, but it did, didn't sound like my voice either. It sounded older, like Dan's maybe, or my father's even. All I could think was that maybe he would let me go if I pretended not to see what he was. If I pretended I didn't see there were flames glowing and dancing where his eyes should have been. I saved you a nasty sting, perhaps he said, and then, to my horror, came down to the bank where I sat with a dead bee in my wet lap and a bamboo fishing pole in my nerveless hands. His slick old shoes should have slipped on the low grassy weeds which dressed the steep bank, but they didn't, nor did they leave tracks behind, I saw. Where his feet had touched, or seemed to touch, there was not a single broken twig, or crushed leaf, or trampled shoe shape. 
Even before he reached me, I recognized the aroma baking up from the skin under the suit. The smell of burnt matches. The smell of sulfur. The man in the black suit was the devil. He had walked out of the deep woods of Martin, and now he was standing here beside me. From the corner of one eye, I could see a hand as pale as the hand of a store window dummy. The fingers were hideously long. He hungered beside me on his hams. His knees popped just as the knees of any normal man might, but he moved his hands so they dangled between his knees and saw that each one of those long fingers ended in what was not a fingernail but a long yellow claw. You didn't answer my question, Fisher boy, he said in his mellow voice. It was now that I think of it, like the voice of one of those radio announcers on the Big Band shows years later, the ones that would sell Geritol and Scrutan and Ovaltine and Dr. Grambo Pipes. Are we well met? Please don't hurt me, I whispered in a voice so low I could barely hear it. I was more afraid than I could ever write down, more afraid than I want to remember. But I do. I do. It never crossed my mind that to hope I was having a dream, although I might have. I suppose if I had been older, but I wasn't older, I was nine. I knew the truth when it squatted down on its hunkers beside me. I knew a hawk from a handsaw, as my father would have said. The man who had come out of the woods on that Saturday afternoon in midsummer was the devil, and inside the empty holes of his eyes his brains were burning. Oh, do I smell something? He asked as if he hadn't heard me, although I knew he had. Do I smell something wet? He leaned forward towards me with his nose stuck out like someone who means to smell a flower, and I noticed an awful thing. As the shadow of his head traveled over the bank, the grass beneath it turned yellow and died. He lowered his head towards my pants and sniffed, his glaring eyes half closed as if he had inhaled some sublime aroma and wanted to concentrate on nothing but that. Oh, bad, he cried, lovely bad. And then he chanted, opal, diamond, sapphire, jade, I smell Gary's lemonade. Then he threw himself on his back in the little flat place and laughed wildly. It was the sound of a lunatic. I thought about running, but my legs seemed two counties away from my brain. I wasn't crying, though. I wet my pants like a baby, but I wasn't crying. I was too scared to cry. I suddenly knew that I was going to die, and probably painfully. The worst of it was, that might not be the worst of it. The worst of it might come later, after I was dead. He sat up suddenly, the smell of burnt matches fluffing out from his suit and making me feel gaggy in my throat. He looked at me solemnly from his narrow white face and burning eyes, but there was a sense of laughter about him. There was always that sense of laughter about him. Sad news, Fisher boy, he said. I've come with sad news. I could only look at him. The black suit, the fine black shoes, the long white fingernails, and it did not in nails, but in talons. Your mother is dead. No. I cried. I thought of her making bread of the curl lying across her forehead and just touching her eyebrow, standing there in the strong morning sunlight, and the terror swept over me again, but not for myself this time. Then I thought of how she'd looked when I set off with my fishing pole, standing in the kitchen doorway with her hand shading her eyes, and how she had looked to me in that moment like a photograph of someone you expected to see again but never did. No, you lie! I screamed. He smiled the sadly patient smile of a man who has often been accused falsely. I'm afraid not, he said. It was the same thing that happened to your brother, Gary. It was a bee. No, that's not true, I said, and now I did begin to cry. She's old, she's thirty-five. If a bee, if a bee sting could kill her the way it did Danny, she would have died a long time ago, and you're a lying bastard. I had called the devil a lying bastard. On some level I was aware of this, but the entire front of my mind was taken up by the enormity of what he'd said. My mother? Dead? He might as well have told me that there was a new ocean where the Rockies had been. But I believed him. On some level I believed him completely. 
as we always believe on some level the worst thing our hearts can imagine. I understand your grief, little fisher boy, but that particular argument just doesn't hold water, I'm afraid. He spoke in a tone of bogus comfort that was horrible, maddening, without remorse or pity. A man can go his whole life without seeing a mockingbird, you know. But does that mean mockingbirds don't exist? Your mother... A fish jumped below us. The man in the black suit frowned, then pointed a finger at it. The trout convulsed in the air, and its body bending so strenuously that for a split second it appeared to be snapping at its own tail, and when it fell back into the castle stream it was floating, lifelessly, dead. It struck the big gray rock where the waters divided, spun around twice in the whirlpool eddy that formed there, and then floated off in the direction of Castle Rock. Meanwhile, the terrible stranger turned his burning eyes again on me. His thin lips pulled back from tiny rows of sharp teeth in a cannibal smile. Your mother simply went through her entire life without being stung by a bee, he said. But then, less than an hour ago, actually, one flew in through the kitchen window while she was taking the bread out of the oven and putting it on the counter to cool. No, I, I won't hear this. I won't hear this. I won't. I raised my hand and clapped them over my ears. He pursed his lips as if to whistle and blew at me gently. It was only a little breath, but the stench was foul beyond belief. Clogged sewers, outhouses that have never known a single sprinkle of lime, dead chickens after a flood. My hands fell away from the sides of my face. Good, he said. You need to hear this, Gary. You need to hear this, my little fisher boy. It was your mother who passed that final weakness on to your brother, Dan. You got some of it, but you also got protection from your father that poor Dan somehow missed. He pursed his lips again, only this time he made a cruelly comic little <coughs> sound instead of blowing his nasty breath at me. So, although I don't like to speak ill of the dead... It's almost a case of poetic justice, isn't it? After all, she killed your brother Dan as surely as she had put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. No, I whispered. No, it isn't true. I assure you it is, he said. The bee flew in the window and lit on her neck. She slapped at it before she even knew what she was doing. You were wiser than that, weren't you, Gary? And the bee stung her. She felt her throat start to close up at once. That's what happens, you know, to people who are allergic to bee venom. Their throats close, and they drown in the open air. That's why Dan's face was so swollen and purple. That's why your father covered it with his shirt. I stared at him. Now, in incapable of speech, tears streamed down my cheeks. I didn't want to believe him, and knew from my church schooling that the devil is the father of lies, but I did believe him, just the same. I believed he had been standing there in our dooryard, looking in the kitchen window as my mother fell to her knees, clutching at her swollen throat while Candy Bill danced around her, barking shrilly. She made the most wonderfully awful noises. The man in the black suit said reflectively, and she scratched her face quite badly, I'm afraid. Her eyes bulged out like a frog's eyes. She wept. He paused, then added, she wept as she died. Isn't that sweet? And here's the most beautiful thing of all. After she was dead, after she had been lying on the floor for 15 minutes or so with no sound but the stove ticking and with that little stick of a bee stinger still poking out the side of her neck. So small. So small. Do you know what Candy Bill did? That little rascal licked away her tears. First on one side, and then on the other. He looked out at the stream for a moment his face sad and thoughtful. Then he turned back to me and his expression of bereavement disappeared like a dream. 
His face was as slack and avid as the face of a corpse that had died hungry. His eyes blazed. I could see his sharp little teeth between his pale lips. I'm starving, he said abruptly. I'm going to kill you and tear you open and eat your guts, little fisher boy. What do you think about that? No, I tried to say. Please, no. But no sound came out. He meant to do it. I saw he really meant to do it. I'm just so hungry, he said, both petulant and teasing. And you won't want to live without your precious mommy anyhow, take my word for it, because your father's the sort of man who will have to have some warm hole to stick it in, believe me. And if you're the only one available, you're the only one who will have to serve. I'll save you all that discomfort and unpleasantness. Also, you'll go to heaven. Think of that. Murdered souls always go to heaven. So we'll both be serving God this afternoon, Gary. Isn't that nice? He reached for me again with his long, pale hands, and without thinking what I was doing, I flipped open the top of my creel, pawed all the way to the bottom, and brought out the monster brookie I caught earlier, the one I should have been satisfied with. I held it out to him blindly, my fingers in the red slits of its belly from which I had removed its insides, and the man in the black suit had threatened to remove mine. The fish's glazed eye stared dreamily at me. The gold ring around the black center reminded me of my mother's wedding ring. And in that moment I saw her lying in her coffin with the sun shining off the wedding band and I knew it was true. She had been stung by a bee. She had drowned in the warm bread smell in kitchen air and Candy Bill had licked her dying tears from her swollen cheeks. Big fish! The man in the black suit cried in a guttural, greedy voice. Oh, big fish! He snatched it away from me and crowded it into a mouth that opened wider than any human mouth ever could. Many years later, when I was 65, I know I was 65 because that was the summer I retired from teaching, I went to the New England Aquarium and I finally saw a shark. The mouth of the man in the black suit was like that shark's mouth when it opened, only his gullet was blazing red, same color as his awful eyes, and I felt heat bake out of it and onto my face, the way you feel a sudden wave of heat come pushing out of a fireplace when a dry piece of wood catches a light. And I didn't imagine that heat either. I know I didn't, because just as he slid the head of my 19-inch brook trout between his gaping jaws, I saw the scales along the side of the fish rise up and begin to curl like bits of paper floating over an open incinerator. He slid the fish in like a man in a traveling show swallowing a sword. He didn't shoo, and his blazing eyes bulged out as if in effort, the fish went in and went in. His throat bulged as it slid down his gullet, and now he began to cry tears of his own, except his tears were blood, scarlet and thick. I think it was the sight of those bloody tears that gave me my body back. I don't know why that should have been, but I think it was. I bolted to my feet like a jack released from its box. I turned with my bamboo pole still in one hand and fled up the bank, bedding over and tearing through bunches of weeds without my free hand in an effort to get up the slope more quickly. He made a strangled, furious noise, the noise of a man with his mouth too full, and looked back just as I got to the top. He was coming after me, the black of his suit flapping and his thin gold watch chain flashing and winking in the sun. The tail of the fish was protruding from his mouth and I could smell the rest of it, roasting in the oven of his throat. He reached for me, groping with his talons, and I fled along the top of the bank. After a hundred yards or so, I found my voice and went to screaming. Screaming in fear, of course, but also screaming in grief for my beautiful dead mother. He was coming along after me. I could hear snapping branches and whipping bushes, but I didn't look back again. I lowered my head, slid my eyes against the bushes and low-hanging branches along the stream bank and ran as fast as I could. At every step, I expected to feel his hands descending upon my shoulders, pulling me back into a final hot hug. That didn't happen. Some unknown length of time later, it could have been longer than five or ten minutes, I suppose, but it seemed like forever, I saw the bridge through the layer in the leaves and furs. 
Still screaming but breathlessly now, sounding like a tea kettle which had almost boiled dry, I reached this second, steeper bank and charged up to it. Halfway up to the top, I slipped to my knees, looked over my shoulder and saw the man in the black suit almost at my heels. His white face pulled into a convulsion of fury and greed. His cheeks were splattered with his blood, tears, and his sharp mouth hung open like a hinge. Fisher boy! He snarled and started up the bank after me, grasping at my foot with one long hand. I tore free, turned, and threw my fishing pole at him. He batted it down easy, but it tangled his feet up somehow, and he went to his knees. I didn't wait to see any more. I turned and bolted up to the top of the slope. I almost slipped at the very top, but managed to grab one of the support struts running underneath the bridge to save myself. You can't get away, fisher boy. He cried from behind me. He sounded furious, but he also sounded as if he were laughing. It takes more than a mouthful of trout to fill me up. Leave me alone, I screamed back at him. I grabbed the bridge's railing and threw myself over it in a clumsy somersault, filling my hands with splinters and bumping my head so hard on the boards when I came down that I saw stars. I rolled over onto my belly and began crawling. I lurched to my feet just before I got to the end of the bridge, stumbled once, found my rhythm, and then began to run. I ran as only a nine-year-old boy can run, which is like the wind. It felt as if my feet only touched the ground with every third or fourth stride, and for all I knew that may be true. I ran straight up the right-hand wheel rut in the road, ran until my temples pounded and my eyes pulsed in their sockets. Ran until I had a hot stitch in my left side from the bottom of my ribs to my armpit. Ran until I could taste blood and something like metal shavings in the back of my throat. When I couldn't run anymore, I stumbled to a stop and looked back over my shoulder. Huffing, puffing, and blowing like a windbroke horse. I was convinced I would see him standing right there beside me with his natty black hair, the watch chain a glittering loop across his vest and not a hair out of place. But he was gone. The road stretching back towards Castle Stream between the darkly massed pines and spruces was empty, and yet I sensed him somewhere near those woods, watching me with his grass fire eyes, smelling of burnt matches and roasted fish. I turned and began walking as fast as I could, limping a little. I'd pulled muscles in both legs, and when I got out of bed the next morning, I was so sore I could barely walk. I didn't notice those things then, though. I just kept looking over my shoulder, needing again and again to verify that the road behind me was still empty. It was, each time. But those backward glances seemed to increase my fear rather than lessen it. The furs looked darker, massier and I kept imagining what lay behind the trees which march behind the road. Long, tangled corridors of forests, leg-breaking deadfalls, ravines where anything might live. Until that Saturday in 1914, I had thought that bears were the worst thing that the forest could hold. Now I know better. A mile or so further up the road, just beyond the place where it came out of the woods and joined the gay and flat road, I saw my father walking towards me and whistling the old oaken bucket. He was carrying his own rod, the one with the fancy spinning reel for a monkey ward. In his other hand, he had his creel, the one with the ribbon my mother had woven through the handle back when Dan was still alive. Dedicated to Jesus, that ribbon said. I had been walking, but when I saw him, I started to run again, screaming, Dad! 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 at the top of my lungs and staggering from side to side. On my tired, sprung legs like a drunken sailor. The expression of surprise on his face when he recognized me might have been comical under other circumstances, but not under these. He dropped his rod and creel into the road without so much as a downward glance at them and ran to me. It was the fastest I ever saw Dad run in his life. When he came together, it was a, one it was a wonder the impact didn't knock us both senseless. I struck my face on his belt buckle hard enough to start a little nosebleed. I didn't notice that until later, though. Right then, I only reached out my arms and clutched him as hard as I could. I held on and rubbed my hot face back and forth against his belly, covering his old blue work shirt with blood and tears and snot. Gary, what is it? What happened? Are you all right? Ma's dead, I sobbed. I met a man in the woods and he just told me. Ma's dead. She got stung by a bee and it swelled her all up just like what happened to Dan. And she's dead. She's on the kitchen floor and uh, Candy Bill <laughs> licked the t t t tears off, off of her... Off... Off her face was the last word I had to say, but by then my chest was hitching so bad I couldn't get it out. 
My tears were flowing again, and my dad's startled, frightened face had blurred into the three overlapping images. I began to howl, not like a little kid who scun his knee, but like a dog that's seen something bad by moonlight. My father pressed my head against his hard, flat stomach again. I slipped out from under his hand, though, and looked back over my shoulder. I wanted to make sure the man in the black suit wasn't coming. There was no sign of him. The long, winding road back to the woods was completely empty. I promised myself I would never go back down that road again, not ever, no matter what. And I suppose now God's greatest blessing to his creatures below is that they can't see the future. It might have broken my mind if I had known I would be going back down that road, and not two hours later. For that moment, though, I was only relieved to see we were still alone. Then I thought of my mother, my beautiful dead mother, and lay my face back against my father's stomach and bawled some more. Gary, listen to me, he said a moment or two later. I went on bawling. He gave me a little longer to do that than reached down and lifted my chin so he could look into my face and I could see into his. Your mom's fine, he said. I could only look at him with tears streaming down my cheeks. I didn't believe him. I don't know who told you different or what kind of dirty dog would want to put a scare into a little boy, but I swear to God your mother's fine. But, but he said, I don't care what he said. I got back from Eversham's earlier than I expected. I didn't want to sell any cows and it's all just talk. And I decided I had time to catch up with you. I got my pole and my creel and your mother made us a couple of jelly foldovers. The new bread, still warm. <laughs> so she was fine half an hour ago, Gary. There's nobody knows any different that's come from this direction, I guarantee you. Not in just half an hour's time. He looked over my shoulder. Who was that man? And where was he? I'm going to find him and thrash him within an inch of his life. I thought a thousand things in just two seconds. That's what seemed. That's what it seemed like anyway. The last thing I thought was the most powerful. If my dad met up with the man in the black suit, I didn't think my dad would be the one to do the thrashing. Or the walking away. I kept remembering those long white fingers and the talons at the end of them. Gary? I, I don't know that I remember, I said. Were you where the stream splits, the big rock? I can never lie to my father when he asked me a direct question, not to save his life or mine. Yes, but don't go down there. I seized his arm with both hands and tugged it hard. Please don't. He was a scary man. Inspiration struck like an illuminating lightning bolt. I think he had a gun. He looked at me thoughtfully. Maybe there wasn't a man, he said lifting his voice a little on the last word and turning it into something that almost, but not quite, a question. Maybe you fell asleep while you were fishing, son, and had a bad dream, like the ones you had about Danny last winter. I had had a lot of bad dreams about Dan last winter, dreams where I would open doors to our closet or a dark, fruity interior of the cider shed and see him standing there and looking at me out of his purple, strangulated face. For many of these dreams, I had awakened screaming and awakened my parents as well. I had fallen asleep on the bank of the stream for a little while, too. Dozed off, anyway. But I hadn't dreamed. And I was sure that I had awakened just before the man in the black suit clapped the bee dead, sending it tumbling off my nose and into my lap. I hadn't dreamed him the way I had dreamed Dan. I was quite sure of that. Although my meeting with him had already attained a dreamlike quality in my mind, and I suppose supernatural occurrences always must. But if my dad thought that the man had only existed in my own head, that might be better. Better for him. It might have been, I guess, I said. Well, we ought to go back and find your rod and your creel. He actually started in that direction, and I had to tug frantically at his arm to stop him and turn him back towards me. Later, I said, please, Dad, I want to see Mother. I've got to see her with my own eyes. He thought that over, then nodded. Yes, I suppose you do. We'll go home first and get your rod and creel later. So we walked back to the farm together, my father with his fish pole propped up on his shoulder just like one of my friends, me carrying his creel, both of us eating folded over slices of my mother's bread, smeared with black currant jam. Did you catch anything? He asked as we came inside of the barn. Yes, sir, I said. A rainbow. Pretty good sized. 
and a brookie that was a lot bigger, I thought, but didn't tell. Biggest one I ever saw, to tell the truth, but I don't have that one to show you, Dad. I gave that one to the man in the black suit so he wouldn't eat me. And it worked, but just barely. That's all, nothing else. After I caught it, I fell asleep. This was not really an answer, but not really a lie either. Lucky you didn't lose your pole. You didn't, did you, Gary? No, sir, I said reluctantly. Lying about that would do no good, even if I'd been able to think up a wobber. Not if he was set on going back to get my creel anyway, and I could see by his face that he was. Up ahead, Candy Bill raced out of the back door, barking his shrill bark and wagging his whole rear end back and forth the way Scotty's do when they're excited. I couldn't wait any longer, hope and anxiety bubbled up in my throat like foam. I broke away from my father and ran to the house, still lugging his creel and still convinced in my heart of hearts that I was going to find my mother dead on the kitchen floor with her face swelled and purple like Dan's head when my father carried him from the west field crying and calling the name of Jesus. But she was standing at the counter, just as well and fine as when I had left, humming a song as she shelled peas into a bowl. She looked at me, first in surprise, then fright as she took in my wide eyes and pale cheeks. Gary! What is it? What's the matter? I didn't answer. Only ran to her and covered her with kisses. At some point, my father came in and said, Don't worry, Lo. He's all right. He just had one of his bad dreams down there by the brook. Pray God it's the last of them, she said, and hugged me tighter while Candy Bill danced around our feet, barking his shrill bark. You don't have to come with me if you don't want to, Gary. My father said, although he had already made it clear that he thought I should, that I should go back, that I should face my fear, and I suppose folks would say nowadays, as very well for fearful things that I make believe, but two hours hadn't done much to change my conviction that the man in the black suit had been real. I wouldn't be able to convince my father of that, I thought. I don't think there was a nine-year-old that ever lived who would have been able to convince his father he'd seen the devil come walking out the woods in a black suit. I'll come, I said. I walked out of the house to join him before he left, mustering all my courage in order to get my feet moving. And now we were standing by the chopping block in the side yard, not far from the woodpile. What do you got behind your back? I, he asked. I brought it out, slowly. I would go with him, and I would hope the man in the black suit with the arrow straight part down the left side of his head was gone, but if he wasn't, I wanted to be prepared, as pre prepared as I could be anyway. I had the family Bible in the hand I had brought out from behind my back. I would set out to just bring my New Testament, which I had won from memorizing the most psalms in the Thursday night youth fellowship competition. I managed eight, although most of them, except the 23rd, have floated out of my mind in a week's time. But the little red testament didn't seem like enough when you were maybe going to face the devil himself. Not even when the word of Jesus was marked out in red ink. My father looked at the old Bible, swelled with family documents and pictures. I thought he'd tell me to put it back, but he didn't. A look of mixed grief and sympathy crossed his face, and he nodded. All right, he said. Does your mother know you took that? No, sir. He nodded again. Then we'll hope she doesn't spot it gone before we get back. Come on, and don't drop it. Half an hour or so later, the two of us stood at the bank looking down at the place where Castle Stream forked in the flat place where I'd had my encounter with the man with the red-orange eyes. I had my bamboo rod in my hand. I picked it up below the bridge, and my creel lay below on the flat place. Its wicker top was flipped back. We stood looking down, my father and I, for a long time, and neither of us said anything. Opal, diamond, sapphire, jade, I smell Gary's lemonade. That had been his unpleasant poem and once he had recited it, he had thrown himself on his back, laughing like a child who had just discovered he had enough courage to say bathroom words like shit or piss. The flat place down there was as green as lush as any day that in Maine that the sun can get to in early July, except where the stranger had lain. There the grass was dead and yellow in the shape of a man. I looked down and I saw I was holding our lumpy old family Bible straight out in front of me with both thumbs pressed so hard on the cover that they were white. It was the way Mama Sweet's husband Norwell held a willow fork when he was trying to douse somebody a well. Stay here, my father said at last, and skidded sideways down the bank, 
digging his shoes into the rich soil and holding his arms out for balance. I stood where I was, holding the Bible stiffly out the ends of my arms like a willow fork. My heart thumping wildly. I don't know if I had a sense of being watched that time or not. I was too scared to have a sense of anything, except for a sense of wanting to be away from that place in those woods. My dad bent down, sniffed at where the grass was dead, and grimaced. I knew what he was smelling. Something like burnt matches. Then he grabbed my creel and came on back up the bank, hurrying. He snagged one fast look over his shoulder to make sure nothing was coming along behind. Nothing was. When he handed me the creel, the lid was still hanging back on its cunning little leather hinges. I looked inside and saw nothing but two handfuls of grass. Thought you said you caught a rainbow, my father said. But maybe you dreamed that, too. Something in his voice stung me. No, sir, I said. I caught one. Well, it sure as hell didn't flip-flop out. Not if it was gutted and cleaned, and you wouldn't put a catch in your fisher box without doing that, would you, Gary? I taught you better than that. Yes, sir, you did. But, so if you didn't dream catching it, and it was dead in the box, something must have come along and eaten it, my father said. And then he grabbed another quick glance over his shoulder, eyes wide, as if he heard something move in the woods. I wasn't exactly surprised to see drops of sweat starting out on his forehead like a big clear jewel. Come on, he said. Let's get the hell out of here. I was for that, and we went back along the bank to the bridge, walking quickly without speaking. When we got there, my dad dropped to one knee and examined the place where he'd found my rod. There was another patch of dead grass there, and the lady's slipper was all brown and curled in on itself, as if a blast of heat had charred it. While my father did this, I looked in my empty creel. He must have gone back and eaten my other fish, too, I said. My father looked up at me and said, Other fish? Yes, sir, didn't I tell you? But I caught a brookie, too, a big one. He was awful hungry, that fella. I wanted to say more, and the words trembled just behind my lips, but in the end, I didn't. We climbed up the bridge and helped one another over the railing. My father took my creel, looked into it, and went back to the railing and threw it over. I came up beside him in time to see it splash down and float away like a boat, riding lower and lower in the stream as the water poured in between the wicker weavings. It smelled bad, my father said, but he didn't look at me when he said it, and his voice sounded oddly defensive. It was the only time I'd ever heard him speak that way. Yes, sir. We'll tell your mother we couldn't find it. If she asks. If she doesn't ask, we won't tell her anything. No, sir, we won't. And she didn't, and we didn't. And that's the way it was. That day in the woods is 81 years gone, and for many of the years in between, I have never even thought of it, not awake at least. Like any other man or woman who's ever lived, I can't say about my dreams, not for sure. But now I'm old, and I dream awake, it seems. My infirmities have crept up like waves which will soon take a child's abandoned sandcastle, and my memories have also crept up, making me think of some old rhyme that went in part. Just leave them alone, and they'll come home, wagging their tails behind them. I remember meals I ate, games I played, girls I kissed in the school cloakroom when we played post office, boys I chummed with, the first drink I ever took, the first cigarette I ever smoked corn shucked behind Dicky Hammer's pig shed and I threw up. Yet of all the memories, the one of the man in the black suit is the strongest and glows with its own spectral haunted light. He was real, and he was the devil, and that day I was either his errand or his luck. I feel more and more strong that escaping him was my luck. Just luck. And not the intercession of the god I had worshipped and sung hymns to all my life. As I lay here in my nursing home room, in the ruined sand castle that is my body, I tell myself that I need fear not the devil, that I have lived a good, kindly life, and I need not fear the devil. Sometimes I remind myself that it was I, not my father, who finally coaxed my mother back to church later on that summer. In the dark, however, those thoughts have no power to ease or comfort. In the dark comes a voice which whispers that the nine-year-old boy I was had n done nothing from which he might legitimately fear the devil either. 
and yet the devil came. And in the dark, I sometimes hear that voice drop even lower, into ranges which aren't human. Big fish. It whispers in tones of hushed greed, and all the truths of the moral world fall to ruin before its hunger. Big fish. The devil came to me once, long ago. Suppose he were to come again now. I'm too old to run away now. I can't even get to the bathroom and back without my walker. I have no large brown brook trout will wish to propitate him, even for a moment or two. I am old, and my creel is empty. Suppose he were to come back and find me so, and suppose he is still hungry. The end. STS Spooktober is produced in collaboration with Stories Telling Stories and STS Media Group, scaring itself silly at Millhouse Studios in Milton, Vermont, casting around the globe to your frontal lobe, wherever podcasts are found. STS Spooktober is also streaming on YouTube at Stories Telling Stories. Make sure to give us a review wherever you stream our show. We really appreciate it. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Give us a subscribe on YouTube and consider supporting us on Patreon for exclusive rewards starting at $1 a month or more. And until next time, stay spooky.